not knowing. That's the theme of my sermon for you this morning that I draw from both of the readings and indeed from this seasonal time too. We heard the Israelites in the desert encountering manna for the first time, these words. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. A slightly confusing translation. They tell you exactly what it is and then they say because they didn't know what it was. Uh, a different translation would be, when the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Uh, the name manna that ends up being given to this mysterious substance comes from the Hebrew word that means what or what is it? The, the name of this mysterious food literally is what is it? Not knowing is a theme that's been running throughout my reflections this Easter. I've been thinking of those uh, women coming to the tomb in the very beginning on that first morning just before the dawn and not knowing what had happened to the body of Jesus, of them running back to tell the disciples the good news of his resurrections and the disciples not knowing whether or not to believe the words that they were hearing, of Thomas not knowing because he didn't see, because he wasn't there when Jesus appeared. And not knowing is a very good theme for the reading that we heard from Revelation. First we heard about uh, God being furious with these people who hold to the doctrine of Nicolantines. The doctrine of Nicolantines, which thing I hate. Unfortunately, it's never recorded to us what this doctrine might be. The earliest source that we have is um, Bishop Isidore of Seville. He's writing 700 years later, and he suggested it was some sort of uh, wife-swapping cult. But we really don't know what it was that the Lord was so furious about. And then we have these enigmatic words. You'll receive hidden manna and a white stone with a new name. We know from the story that continues of, uh, of the manna uh, from amongst the Israelites that manna was stored in an urn that was placed in the Ark of the Covenant and it was manna that didn't rot and go off and grow worms unlike the rest of the manna that they collected if they held it over to the next day. That was the whole point about uh, only having today your daily bread, so to speak just providing enough for each day as it goes by. But some was collected and stored in the ark. So maybe that's the illusion. Or perhaps it's about God's ability to sustain us each day, this hidden manner. The early church fathers, they saw in it an allusion to the Eucharist. They looked at that moment where uh, the, the gathered Israelite leaders are asking Jesus for a sign, like the sign that Moses gave in the manna. And Jesus responds to them, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread of life that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. Jesus brings down from heaven the treasury of manna. And it's put away this hidden manna for future generations in the Eucharist under the appearance of bread and of wine. The Eucharist, which we receive as a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, that time when we will come face to face with our Lord. Until then, we feed on the hidden manna that Christ gives us in the Eucharist. But all of these explanations are simply that explanations, suppositions, propositions, we don't have uh, a straightforward answer. And the white stone that John mentions with a new name is even more complex. We know about the giving of new names, a new name that uh, Simon gets, he becomes Simon Peter, that Saul becomes Paul. We know that new names are a mark of the work of God in the lives of his people. We also know that in ancient Greece, jury members 
would cast stones, black stones to signify guilt, white stones to signify acquittal and innocence. Perhaps this is the interpretation of a, a white stone with a new name on it, about our acquittal from our sins, the forgiveness we receive from God. We know too that pebbles with names on them were left outside the front of the temple for those people who had received healing within as a mark of their thanksgiving. Perhaps this is about the healing that we receive at the hands of God. We know that white stones were given as awards, medals if you like, at the Olympics for those who won the contests. Perhaps this is about the victory we have in Christ. We know that white pebbles were used as tokens of admittance to Roman events. Perhaps this is about our token of admittance to God's heavenly realm. It's not that this passage from Revelation is particularly hard or awkward to understand. It's not that there's something there that feels very off to us. It's that we just simply don't have access to the reference. We don't have access to the symbolism that John is using here. It's not part of the language of symbolism that we now use, and neither has it been passed down to us with explanation in some more clear form. We're just in a position where we don't know. It's a situation where we have to come to find some comfortable resolution in ourselves with not being able to find out the answer what his original intention was. But that's not a situation that I find comfortable at all. In fact, it's very uh, much a situation that, that I cannot abide. One of the few things that really gets me upset is not being able to understand. I was um, 14 or 15 in a maths class at school, well beyond the age at which it was acceptable to show any emotion at all as a teenage boy. And I remember breaking down into tears in front of my classmates because I just couldn't grasp this concept of differential equations or whatever we were being taught at the time, while everybody else around me was busily getting on with their work. Not being able to understand is not something that sits comfortably at all. One of the things that uh, I have great pleasure in doing is uh, marriage preparation for those people who will be getting married here in this church and sometimes those who will be getting married elsewhere but live within the parish. I offer a fairly uh, straightforward suggestion to them when we look at conflict within marriage, which is session two, and I say to them that it's fairly wise to communicate with your partner and that many, if not most, arguments centre around a difference in expectations rather than any concrete disagreement. And that managing those expectations, being aware of your partner's expectations, is the majority of the work that prevents arguments before they begin. It's all about knowledge, it's about knowing beforehand. And so this lack of knowing is, for me, an uncomfortable place to be. You'll be pleased to know that I don't simply offer uh, marriage preparation to those who are not yet married, but uh, if you've been married for 10 or 20 or 40 years, open and available to you too, come and see me after the service. I've been saying these words about uh, knowing your partner's expectations for a while, and I realise that they have this tendency to sound a bit manipulative. As if I were saying somehow, well, if you can control the situation and shape it in advance in the direction that you'd like it to move, then you can avoid the argument at all, but still end up with the solution and the outcome that you were always intending. I often think they have a tendency to sound a bit like a sort of pop psychology manual, how to influence people in the way that you desire. Well, recently, one of the couples that I was preparing told me that they felt that in addition to this uh, knowing about your partner and this communication, it was important to go into any disagreement with the attitude that you may be incorrect. I'd never quite couched it in those words, but it seems to me that that's something that I fundamentally believe 
if not something that I always fundamentally practice. It's an odd experience for us, of course, because we tend to work on the assumption that what we think and what we believe is right until we've been shown otherwise. Uh, and when we are shown otherwise, often we're uh, delighted or taken by surprise. Think of those uh, times when we see optical illusions. But on matters of belief, and I don't just mean here uh, religious belief, but rather the kind of arguments that arise when one person thinks that white stones represent entrance tokens and another person thinks that they are to do with jury's decisions. In those cases of belief, with limited evidence where we don't have access to a definitive answer, we tend to argue as forcefully as we can for our position, which often mitigates our belief in our own fallibility. So often, the truth of the matter is that I don't really know, and more generally, we don't really know, but the option that I like to believe is this one, and so I'm sticking by it. Reminding ourselves of this fact that we ought to go into disagreements firm in the knowledge that we too might be wrong, I think helps us to live rather more peaceful lives and especially rather less prideful ones. I'm occasionally asked uh, at the pub why I think people ought to bother coming to church. And I think it's a very good question. My answer is not because I can't think of anything better to do on a Sunday morning, because that's not the whole truth. Not that I dislike being here by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not always what would be top of my agenda if I was given complete free control. You might think I'm going to say that it's about the importance of worshipping God. Uh, and I am all for that, and especially for that, in those times when you don't really feel like it. But that doesn't quite answer the question of why come to church. I think what people are often getting at, what's lurking behind that question is, why come to church rather than simply do your religion privately? And for me, the reason is this one that that wedding couple drew out for me about pride, about the firmness of our belief in our own knowledge. Being part of a church is about being part of a community of believers who can hold you accountable and against whom you can test your personal discernment. It means being surrounded by a bunch of people, all of whom share the principles which are most foundational to your life and with whom you can acknowledge your ignorance. It's about the realisation that we cannot go it alone and that sometimes we have to accept the limitations of our knowledge. This is what um, Paul says when he's making a decision about what course to follow. He says, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Not, it seemed good to me, but it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us, to the gathered body of Christ. If these readings, which are full of symbolism that we don't understand, have something to teach us at all, then perhaps this is it. That the next time that we're about to say, well, that seems good to me, perhaps we should take a moment to check the pride that we place in our own ability to discern clearly and think instead, whilst that seems good to me, is it what seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us, that is to say, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, the people gathered in our church community. That is where we find our true discernment, not in the pride of our own knowledge and ability, but in the sharing of the knowledge that we have as a body together in Christ. Amen.